My name is Howard Eaton. I'm the uh, founder director of Eaton Aerosmith uh, School here in White Rock. Uh, it's, I know some of the families are here who may not have met me yet, and uh, hopefully afterwards we can say hello. Um, the, how it's going to go, we're going to have Fisher uh, Brown, who's going to introduce Barbara Aerosmith Young. Uh, and Fisher was a student at Eaton Aerosmith School in White Rock starting in 2013. Uh, he uh, came in, his, his father sent an email to our admissions person principal in White Rock asking about the Aerosmith program and whether or not it would be uh, the right program for his son. His son was tested as uh, gifted with learning disabilities, uh, which in the field of special ed is the twice exceptional. Uh, gifted alone can cause problems academically, uh, but if you have learning disabilities, it even adds uh, often more suffering uh, to the school experience. Uh, Fisher had difficulties with uh, math. He had dyscalculia. He had difficulties with attention uh, or executive processing, planning, organizing, uh, executing ideas. Uh, he had difficulty with written expression uh, as well, and he spent two years full-time at the Eaton Aerosmith School here in White Rock, uh, and in talking to the principal, made exceptional progress in the cognitive exercises he was assigned through the Aerosmith program. Uh, he recently transitioned to a high school here, I think it's Elgin, that's right, Elgin, uh, and uh, we phoned him and said, would you like to introduce uh, Barbara to the crowd? And he said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. So I want to get going with uh, Fisher. Come on up, Fisher. Welcome. Hello, everybody. My name is Fisher Brown. I am excelling in school, have lots of friends, and am well-respected among my peers and in the community. However, it was not always so. Today I will be speaking to you about my time at Eaton Aerosmith School and how it has changed my life. Before I came to EAS, I had a variety of different learning difficulties that presented themselves in challenges with math, science, and paying attention in class. When I was in grade 4, I was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactive disorder and dyscalculia. From the time I had been diagnosed, I had tried various different ways to overcome my learning challenges, whether it was flashcards, using alternate tools, or in one case, in grade four, being called up to the front of class and asked to do math problems to set an example. None of these methods worked for me, and it came to the point in grade five that I was at a crossroads. It was either that I was to be medicated, or I was to try something different a new, interesting program called Eaton Aerosmith Program. As some of you might be aware, EAS is based around the idea of neuroplasticity, the idea that one can change their brain through cognitive exercises. This idea was different, but my parents knew that they were going to not have me on medication, so they chose EAS. At EAS, I excelled under the help of the amazing teachers, the friendships that I cherish even to this day, and the wonderful support network that helped me to get to where I am. Three years ago, I was distracted, impulsive, had messy hair, and was not doing well in school. <laughs> Today, I am excelling in school. I have lots of friends and am well respected, on, excuse me, respected among my peers and in the community. I believe with that without a shadow of a doubt, in my mind that the EAS program has helped me to get where I am today. My name is Fisher Brown. Thank you for your time. Just a little shorter. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Fisher, for um, sharing your story, because I know that can sometimes take courage to talk about where your struggles were and where you are now, and congratulations, and maybe next year we'll hear from you again. 
that would be really exciting. And I want to thank um, Howard Eaton for inviting me to come here tonight to speak about what I'm most passionate about, which is the brain, this incredible organ that we carry with us everywhere we go, and its capacity for change. And I also want to thank Howard for having the vision, I think, in was it 2005? Um, and Howard and I had met a few years uh, before that uh, when I came out to speak in Vancouver and people that knew me and knew Howard thought, you know, this would be a great kind of, you know, introduction collaboration. And, and I think Howard uh, was intrigued and interested, but I think you walked away and said, well, she's not crazy, but, you know, I don't think so. And then three students um, who... Howard had assessed here in Vancouver, went to Toronto for the program, and when they came back to Vancouver to go into um, their respective grades in the school system, went back to Howard to be reassessed. And when Howard saw the changes, because he's seen academic changes before, but to see changes, cognitive changes, um, processing, memory, um, reasoning, Howard picked up the phone and said, I want to come and visit. So got on a plane, came and visited in Toronto, and that was 2005, and it's um, been fabulous to have the program here at Eaton Aerosmith, um, both in White Rock and at UBC and Redmond and, um, and also the adult program at ESIC in uh, was that in Oak Ridge, and, and now we're starting with the Watson Center for Brain Health to work with people with um, traumatic um, a brain injury. So just thank you um, very much for your passion and your commitment to this work. So, thank you. So my life and my work has been um, an exploration of the territory of the human brain and how it makes us uniquely who we are. And I think if we can understand this territory, we can have compassionate insight into ourselves and into other people. We can understand what drives our behavior and at times what drives the behavior of others. We know that our brain um, really has a significant role in shaping who we are. It filters our perceptions of ourselves, it filters our perceptions of others, it filters our perceptions of the world and our relationship to it. And to me, what's incredibly promising with this concept of neuroplasticity, not only does our brain shape us, but we now know if we can harness um, neuroplasticity, we can actually shape our brain, which to me is incredibly promising because conditions that we thought were intractable, that people had to live with for their entire life, we now know that isn't the case. And we also often hear the comment, you know, he or she is um, just not good at that whatever that might be. And then we kind of write that off. They're, they're just not good at that, and so we don't have an expectation that they're going to function in, in that area. And with this idea of neuroplasticity, just because somebody isn't good at something at this point doesn't necessarily mean that that's a life sentence, that they always are going to struggle with that. So we can't really escape our brain. We carry it with us everywhere we go. And it's incredibly complex. Research is saying there's something on the order of 86 to 100 billion neurons, nerve cells, that we carry in our brain. And to put that into perspective, if we think about the world's population at about 7 billion, we have incredible complexity in our heads. And we have something on the order of several hundred trillion connections. So this is just a, an image of all the, like not all the connections, but showing some of the connectivity in the brain. So incredibly complex, lots of neurons and lots of connections. And again, to put that into perspective, there are more connections in our brain than all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy combined. So incredibly complex. And to me, what's really interesting is no two brains are exactly alike. So if you think about, um, there are actually more differences between two brains than differences between you physically. So if you look at the person next to you, you think about somebody that you know very well, and note that you know, the shape of their eyes are different, their ears, eye color, height, stature, um, sort of their, their physical being, there are actually more differences between your two brains than all of those physical characteristics combined. So incredibly complex, and it makes us really uniquely who we are and shapes who we, um, we are. And as I mentioned, this concept of neuroplasticity is incredibly promising and very hopeful. We now know that the brain is has um, capacity to change, and it has capacity to change across the lifespan. 
we can grow um, new neural connections. We can increase the, the dendrites on the, the neurons to make more connections. Um, we can fundamentally change the way our brain works and its capacity to learn and to function. So my story begins with my brain. And it's a story of personal discovery. And it was really fueled by my hunt for a solution to very severe and crippling learning disabilities. And it's also a universal story because we all have a brain and it shapes who we are. So I think the more we can understand about the brain, um, the more we can understand about what drives our behavior. So if we think about having a brain that's capable and incapable at the same time, that's the experience of somebody struggling with a learning disability. It certainly was my experience. There were things I could do really easily and there were other things with the best will in the world, no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't do. And it was very confusing. It was confusing to my parents because I could see I could do certain things but not others. And it was very confusing to my teachers. So for me, growing up, I lived in a world that was incredibly confusing and un incomprehensible. I didn't understand at that time that it was parts of my brain that weren't working properly. I just knew that things were, some things were an incredible struggle. And it was almost like language was um, foreign to me. So we know this poem by um, Lewis Carroll, the Jabberwocky. Interpreting language, uh, language to me was about as intelligible as this poem. I could understand concrete things. So if somebody said, you know, it's raining outside, which it does quite often in Vancouver, I could draw an image or a picture in my head and I could understand that. But as soon as it got complex or abstract, if it involved reasoning or making connections between things, relationships, I really struggled and that was incredibly hard for me. Um, I couldn't tell time because to tell time you have to understand the relationship between the hour hand and the minute hand. It's making a connection or seeing a relationship. I couldn't reason logically. Even making decisions was incredibly difficult for me because when you make a decision, you weigh pros and cons. You compare and you contrast. I couldn't make those kinds of comparisons. I couldn't see the relationships between things. I felt incredibly paralyzed, almost like that deer in the headlights, praying that nobody would ask me a question because first I wouldn't really understand the question and then I wouldn't know how to answer so for me, something even as simple as fractions was impossible. I could understand one because I could see one object. I could understand four because I could line up four objects. But you put that one over top of a four, which is a relationship of a part to a whole, it didn't mean anything to me. Even something as simple as you know, trying to understand how my aunt could also be my mother's sister. I couldn't understand how could somebody have two different relationships. It made no sense to me. I was incredibly concrete. Things like bigger than, greater than, less than, um, again, relational concepts, over, under, were really, really hard for me. And all of my notebooks, I would draw pictures because I would use my right hemisphere to try to support what I couldn't understand in language. So draw pictures to try to interpret language, which you know could work to some extent, but it was rather limited. And I got labeled very early in school as being rigid and stubborn. And truly, I was rigid and stubborn, but not coming from an emotional place. It was coming from a cognitive place. Because for me, if I worked something out, it was so hard to come to that understanding. I just wanted to hold on to it for dear life. And if somebody said, well, you know, maybe you look at it this way, or maybe consider this, I felt like I had to let go of this to try to integrate this other information. And it was just too hard for me. So I held on for dear life. And... In my world, there was no cause and effect. I had no insight. Because again, to have cause and effect, you have to make connections. You have to understand why things happen. I didn't understand why things happened. I really thought there was you know, a puppet master somewhere pulling strings because things just seemed to be totally random in my world. And I described my world as living in a fog where meaning was ephemeral. It would just disappear into a mist. And what happened over time, that incredibly... Um, fractured and fragmented view of my world led to an incredibly fractured and fragmented psyche and an incredible fragmented sense of self. So that was one area that wasn't working very well. I also had multiple other areas. I struggled to reg register the location of sensation on the left side of my body. Most people, if they put their hand on a hot burner, would immediately pull it off. I wouldn't. 
because I felt pain when my hand was on the hot burner, but my brain didn't register where the sensation was coming from. So I learned probably around age four or five, I had to watch the left side of my body because I was incredibly accident prone. And my mother later shared with me, she thought I would be dead by the age of five because I was getting into so many accidents because this whole left side of my body was like an alien being. Um, so as I said early on, I learned to use my eyes to compensate. I couldn't do well in sports. I mean, imagine me you know, on a sports team where I didn't know where one side of my body was. And I was always bruised and banged up on the left side of my body. And I would see those bruises, but I would have no idea where they came from or how I got them. And I also struggled to understand three-dimensional space. There were no maps and no representation of space in my brain. Um, it was kind of like the world was flat. And something as simple as crossing a street, which most people take for granted, was terrifying for me. Because when you're crossing a street, you create a mental map of where you are relative to those cars coming at you. And I couldn't create those maps. So my strategy was to walk blocks out of my way to find a stop sign or a stop light where I knew the cars had to stop and I'd be safe. Or I'd wait at the side of the street until somebody else came along and I would follow them across the street and I would pray they didn't have the same difficulty I had so that we'd, we'd get across safely. And I used to joke that you know I'd be as successful crossing the street with my eyes closed as with my eyes open, um, which there was some truth to that. I couldn't interpret a map, so I would get lost all the time and I would calculate in what I called lost time because I knew whenever I went somewhere I would get lost multiple times before I found my way. And things like geometry, geography, any subject matter that had a spatial component was really, really hard for me. Organic chemistry, um, and constructing objects from a diagram. So sewing was really hard. I would sew things on backwards, upside down, um, because I couldn't go from um, you know, a two dimension to three dimension, so it was like a diagram into three dimensional space. So multiple areas that made academics hard for me, but also made sports. I mean, nobody wanted me on the sports team. I was always the very last person picked, and I understand why, because I was not an asset to any athletic endeavor. Um, if a ball came at me, my goal would be to run as fast as I could in the other direction so it wouldn't hit me, because I had no idea where I was, was relative to that ball. And when I began my schooling, this was in the 1950s, and this was what I call the time of the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. The belief at that time was your brain was fixed, and it was unchangeable. If there was a problem, basically, you had to learn to accept it and to live with it. And I was told in grade one that I had a mental block, and being very concrete, I actually thought I had a wooden cube in my head that made learning difficult. I mean, I later learned that I didn't, but I did have blockages. And I really felt like in grade one, I was given a life sentence. My teacher um, explained to my mother that I would never learn like other children. All of my schooling would be a struggle, and I would not really amount to very much. And so I felt like I was condemned to living life in this, this fog and this lack of comprehension, and that my world was going to be a series of disconnected elements. And I did have some strengths. I had a verbatim auditory memory. I had a visual photographic memory, and I had good executive functioning. So I was really driven. Um, I didn't really know where I was driving, but I was, I was driven. Uh, and, I was, and that led to perseverance. And I was very lucky in my parents. My mother had won awards in the province of Ontario for education. She was very passionate about education. And my father was a scientist and an inventor um, and had lots of patents. And my father instilled in me this belief. He said, if there's a problem and there's no solution in the world, he said, don't let that limit you. He said, go out and find a solution. He says, it's your responsibility to go out and see if you can solve that problem. And he said another thing that was really profound to me. He said, and if the rest of the world says you can't do it, he said, do not be limited by conventional wisdom. He said, go out and see what you can find and you can discover. And so I feel like very early on I was set on a quest for the holy grail of could I find a solution for my difficulties? And for me, the solution came in the work, the two lines of research, which became the foundation of the work that I do. Alexander Luria, the gentleman with the glasses, um, was a brilliant Russian neuropsychologist, did a lot of work after World War II, studying Russian soldiers that had very localized wounds to their brain, and he did a lot of work 
mapping the brain and the different functions. And he wrote a book um, with a Russian soldier who had a very localized head wound as the result of an injury in World War II. And this man wrote this book called The Man with the Shattered World. And someone gave that book to me in 1977, which really changed my life. And as I started to read this man's journal, I thought, he's living my life, and I'm living his life. Before his wound, he could tell time. After his wound, he couldn't. I hadn't been able to tell time since birth, and I was now 25, 26, and I still couldn't tell time. He couldn't understand concepts like greater than, less than, all the things that I couldn't do. Um, he couldn't understand logic. He couldn't grasp fractions. He'd been very gifted in mathematics before the injury. And he was also, in his journal, using the same language, talking about living in a fog where meaning was ephemeral and it would disappear. So to me, what this told me was my problem is my brain. It's a part of my brain that isn't working. And to, make a, to solve a problem, you have to understand the nature of the problem. And now I knew the nature of the problem. But what do I do with it? So the next piece of research came uh, with Mark Rosenschweig, who was one of the people looking at this concept of neuroplasticity with rats at Berkeley in California. And he was putting rats into different uh, environments. And what he found was you put a rat in a very enriched environment with lots and lots of toys to play with, which is like stimulation, brain exercise, versus rats that you put in a kind of an impoverished environment with not much to do, and then you gave them um, mazes, like, you know, it's kind of like a little intelligence test for a rat. And he found that the rats that had all this enrichment and stimulation learned more efficiently and more effectively than the rats that didn't have the stimulation. And then, because they were rats, he went and looked at the brains afterwards. And what he found was the brains of those rats with stimulation had changed at a physiological level on multiple variables. So you can sort of see that. Um, neuron there, so they had more dendrites, like more branching, which means there were better neural connections or more neural connections. Um, there were more glia cells, more neurotransmitters, um, enlarged capillaries, so more blood supply going to regions of the brain. And what he concluded was that stimulation led to these changes in the brain, which led to better learning. So I thought, okay, my problem is my brain. Rats have neuroplasticity, and stimulation can lead to positive changes. Maybe I can find an exercise or an activity that can stimulate my brain. And at that time, nobody was looking at human neuroplasticity. But I felt if rats can do this, surely humans must at least have as much neuroplasticity as rats, and probably more. So I set out to create the first exercise for myself to see if I could harness that neuroplasticity. And and try to change something in my brain. And I had no idea if it would work. And I figured, what am I going to lose but time? And I couldn't tell time, so I figured it was OK. Um, so I knew that what I had to do was find an activity or a task that forced my brain to process relationships because that's what it couldn't do. And in reading Lurie's work, he, kept, he talked a lot about clocks, because a clock is a relationship that you have to process to interpret. So the first exercise I created was clocks. And I was pretty abysmal at it, because I couldn't tell time, and I did all sorts of um, things at the very beginning that weren't all that terribly productive. But over time, I started drawing clocks and reading clocks. And got faster and faster at being able to read and more accurate to read a two-handed clock. And that was great. So now I could look at a clock and I could tell the time, but I wasn't really feeling any cognitive change. So I had to make it more complex. So I added a third hand, and that was great. So now I could read a clock with an hour hand, a minute hand, and a second hand, and, but not feeling cognitive change. So then I added another hand. And I had to create all these levels as I was working through. And it was really at that four-handed clock level. And we now have clocks that go up to 10 hands. Um, so incredible complexity. And it was at that point that I knew there was human neuroplasticity. It was, I, I needed, it for me, that level of complexity, which probably is about average level of functioning um, we're seeing in the work that we're doing now. And what I started to be able to do I could actually listen to conversations now after I'd gotten through that level, and I could understand them in real time. And before I lived in what I called lag time, I was hours behind everybody else in interpreting information, and sometimes I never could. So if I was part of a conversation, well, actually, I was never really part of a conversation, but if, if I was listening to a conversation, 
because I had this little mini tape recorder in my head, I would memorize what the people were saying. And then I'd walk away, and for the next two hours, I'd go over and over and over what they were saying to try to interpret it. But by the time I had interpreted it, if I could, those people had long gone. So there was no opportunity to be part of the conversation. Now I could listen, I could understand, I could actually make an intelligent comment, I could understand their response to my comment, and I actually, for the first time in my life, was part of human discourse. It was profound. The other thing that changed is I could actually read material, and I didn't have to read that page 5, 10, 15, 20 times to try to figure out what the author intended or what the meaning was of what I was reading. I could actually read it, I could understand it, I could read the next page, I could relate that page to the page that I'd read before, I could understand in real time. And why I knew there had to be human neuroplasticity is I had tried so hard before, you know, with color coding, with diagrams, to try to understand material that I couldn't. Now I could just do it. And to me, what also was really, under, was really, really interesting, which I hadn't anticipated, but because I had a really strong you know, visual memory, every night as I went to bed, and I was about 26 at this time, images would start to come into my mind's eye from age four, age five, age six. And I say, oh my gosh, that's why this happened. That's why this person said this. That's why this person did this. It was like that shattered part of me, my psyche, started to integrate in a way that it never had. And things made sense that I now could have insight. I could understand why things happened. I could now understand jokes. Before, I couldn't understand jokes. There was no irony in my world because I, I couldn't understand the meaning behind things. I could now understand if somebody was conning me. Before I couldn't, I was really vulnerable to being conned because how do you know that somebody's conning you? You hear the logical inconsistencies in what they're saying. Well, for me, because before there was no logic in my world, there were no logical inconsistencies. Um, and now I was also no longer rigid because I could compare and contrast. If somebody said, let's look at this a different way, I could. I could drop what I had already figured out and integrate that other information into my world. So my world no longer was confusing and terrifying and frightening. And interestingly, I've worked with a number of um, psychiatrists, you know, uh, certainly in Toronto, with my work, where what they'll often say is people work through this exercise, they can benefit from insight therapy. Prior, they couldn't, because if, if they can't do cause and effect, can't see relationships, they can't benefit from insight. So it's, it's a really, really important and critical area. And then the next um, two areas, um, once I saw the change here, I thought, can I create an exercise to address my lack of sensation on the left side of my body? And it was becoming a real problem because now I was driving a car. And if I didn't know where the left side of my body was, I didn't know where the left side of that car was. So my car would be dinged and dented and banged up just like my body, which luckily I didn't ever run over anybody because I was really, really careful. But, you know, it was a possibility. Um, so I knew for that exercise I had to do something with my eyes closed because that was my compensation. So I created an exercise drawing lots of um, simple shapes, complex shapes, with my eyes closed until I could do it as well with my eyes closed as with my eyes open. And over time, I started to be able to map and register sensation on that left side of my body. And now I know where that part of my body is. I can play sports. I'll never be a gifted athlete. But that world is, is open as a possibility. And I'm no longer accident prone. So it made a huge difference. So two very different exercises designed to target two different um, um, cognitive functions leading to differential effect. And then that spatial piece where I had to add lost time into my life, um, I created an exercise for that and again, very different exercise and now I don't get lost. I can read maps. Um, I can translate two-dimensional diagrams into three-dimensional space. I can build things from Ikea. Uh, whereas before, <laughs> I would have to like rip them apart. The, everything would go on upside down or backwards. And interestingly, some of these problems are hereditary. Not all of them, but, but some of them. My mother and I both had this spatial problem at a pretty severe level. And as a child, it was always interesting getting in the car with my mother. So we kind of know where we wanted to end up, and we knew where we were, but we didn't have any idea of what was in between those two places. And my mother had a good attitude. She said, it's going to be an adventure. And we got there eventually, but never the same way twice. And, and um, 
it, it was interesting. And so I thought, you know, this is an interesting kind of, you know, quirk. But I asked her when I understood more about these functions as an adult, had this ever impacted her, you know, in her career? So she shared with me that she'd gone to university to become a chemist. That was what she wanted to do. And partway through her first year at the University of um, Manitoba, she was gently encouraged to drop out of chemistry and go into home economics, which is what, what she did, because she couldn't construct molecules, which is a pretty critical part. She couldn't do that spatial representation that was necessary. And these things work on a continuum from some people are exceptionally strong in an area, some people are average, some people are, have a problem, mild, moderate, severe. And out of my four brothers, um, one of, one of my brothers did become a chemist, but, and he has a little bit of this problem, but it's really mild. So he became a physical chemist rather than an organic chemist because that placed less of a load on these functions. So what I've learned is any one of these cognitive areas of difficulty will have some impact on somebody's functioning. And then, let me just go through this quickly. Um, so what did I learn through this is that we all have our own unique cognitive profile of strengths or weaknesses. The individuals that usually come to um, Eaton Aerosmith or um, Aerosmith School in Toronto or the other Aerosmith programs often have multiple areas of difficulty. So they can't really compensate. Like they're just causing um, difficulties in the learning process. Currently, we can identify 19 different cognitive functions from you know, the child that struggles to read nonverbal cues to the individual that can't recognize symbols, so struggles with reading or spelling, um, problem solving, thinking, a range of, of memory um, issues. And what we do when someone comes into the program is we do an assessment to um, develop or understand that person's unique cognitive profile over the 19 functions to say, okay, this area is working really well, this area is you know, maybe a mild problem, this area is more significant, and then that's what drives the program. So every student is on their own unique program based on their cognitive profile. And if people are interested, there is a, a questionnaire, the Aerosmith Cognitive Profile Questionnaire on the website that people can go in totally privately um, and answer a series of questions, and based on the answers at the end, it will give an indication you know, of possibly some of the difficulties that that person might be struggling with. It's not a replacement for the, the full assessment, um, but it will give an indication, because often parents wonder, is, you know, is this program appropriate? And going through this will tell you if some of the um, symptoms are identified as being some of the areas that we work on, then this program can be of benefit. And if we think about how the brain operates, there's never an individual area that comes together to do a complex task. So this is the brain reading out loud. So there's no one part of the brain that reads. There are multiple um, areas that have to come together when we read. So there's eye tracking. I mean, one of the things you have to do is be able to have motor plans for your eyes to track across a page. You have to be able to discriminate and remember the speech sounds to be able to then put them together to form a word. Um, you have to be able to also recognize and remember the visual symbols. And because the person's reading out loud here, the mouth, the lips, and tongue are moving, so they have a the sensory feedback has to tell them how to get around those sounds for articulation. So reading is very complex. And what we do if somebody comes into um, the program with an identification, say like dyslexia, we don't take it just at that label. We have to drill down to understand what are the cognitive functions that are causing that difficulty for that individual. Because we can see four students all having a reading difficulty, and each one might have a slightly different profile um, it's rare, but it does happen that some students come in that have all of these pieces interfering with the reading process. But somebody might be good visually, but they can't do the phonetic aspect. So we have to identify which component pieces are interfering with the reading process because that's what we address. And if we want to try one of these cognitive functions, you want to see how you do on that, um, here's a simple one. I think everybody here has probably seen a cat at some point in their life. So if you want to think of a cat, if you want to close your eyes and see, can you conjure up a visual image in your mind's eye of a cat? You don't have to do it, but if you want to try that, you take a second. And then 
if you want to open your eyes and see how you did. Some people will see a really vivid image. It's almost like they got that cat right there in front of them. Um, some people much less uh, vivid, and some people will just see the back of their eyelids, like they won't be able to conjure up um, visual imagery. And again, as we said, these work on a continuum. And if somebody's really strong here, this is the person that can navigate using landmarks. I mean, one way you can navigate is spatially with maps, but another way is you remember, if you've gone someplace once, you remember, oh yes, at the, the mailbox with the red maple and the yellow house, that's where I turn right. And they're really good at visual imagery. If somebody has difficulty here, their world is kind of flat and gray. They can't call up you know, their happy place when they're meditating because they don't hold visual imagery. I often call this the refrigerator dysfunction. This is the person that opens the fridge, um, says, well, like, where's the mustard? And it's like right there in front of them because they don't hold the visual image of the thing they're looking for. Somebody with this difficulty wouldn't like to shop because, again, they'll walk by the item um, multiple times. I work with an illustrator at the Ontario College of Art and that's what she wanted to be. And she was gifted in all sorts of areas, but she had this difficulty. And so she'd draw a cat and she'd leave off the whiskers. Or she'd draw a coat and she'd leave off the buttons, which was a problem if you wanted to be an illustrator. So we addressed this problem and she's now actually uh, won awards for her illustrations. Um, so, you know, it, it certainly had a significant difference. And so if somebody's um, also struggles with somebody. This is like Oliver Sacks when he wrote The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, that was pretty severe. Um, I also had a student who had traumatic um, injury in this, this region. The first day he walked into the school, he tried to leave through a filing cabinet at the end of the day because it was rectangular and it had a handle. And so he just thought that was a door. Um, if he saw me in the school, he knew who I was because I was in context. If two minutes later he saw me in the hallway, he'd have no idea who I was because I was out of context. And what was so amazing is we worked with him, um, he developed a visual sense of humor, visual irony, because his whole visual world um, became alive. And imagine if you were um, hired to do product display and you had this problem. It would be, and I did work with somebody who worked for Shoppers Drug Mart, who was a in product display, and it was a real challenge because he didn't recognize you know, his products that he was trying to display. Um, or the person that goes on vacation and comes back and they kind of say, yeah, I had a good time, but they don't really remember the look of anything that they saw on vacation versus the person that can describe it in vivid detail. So that's this, this cognitive function. And some individuals, a part of this region is more um, related to facial recognition. So this is the person that doesn't recognize faces. And I worked with an individual that was a reporter on the Toronto Star. And for 20 years, she rode up in the same elevator every day and down in that same elevator at the end of the day. And she said, I go in on that elevator. I have no idea if any of these people are people I know, um, you know, or they're complete strangers. So she said, I have two options. One is just don't say anything to anybody, assuming I don't know them, or say something to everybody, just assuming that I know everybody. And that's a choice that she made. And she figured that if she didn't really know those people, they just think she was really friendly. But at one point, she got accused of being um, prejudiced. And one of her colleagues said, you think that everybody with a certain skin color looks the same. And she said, actually, it's much worse than that. I think everybody in the world looks the same because she just couldn't recognize faces. And her sons knew she had this difficulty. So when a friend would come to the door, they say, oh, mom, isn't it nice Adam is here? Because as soon as she knew the person's name, she knew who they were. But if she saw the face, she would have no idea who they were. And again, we worked on this function, and now she's able to recognize, um, recognize faces. So if we want to just try another one, this is parallel area, but now that one was in the right hemisphere, this is in the left hemisphere. So instead of thinking of the picture of the cat, call up the symbol, so the word C-A-T. So if you want to try, close your eyes. And on the blackboard, can you see those three symbols? And again, some people will see it really sharp and vivid and crisp. Some people it might be fuzzy, and other people won't see it at all. And this, one researcher calls this the brain's letterbox, another the visual word form area. I call it symbol recognition. This is the part of the brain that holds the visual image of symbol patterns. So the next time you see it, you'll recognize it. So every time you see a new word on the page, you don't have to sound it out. You just learn that that's cat. So obviously this is going to affect somebody in terms of spelling, in terms of word recognition, reading speed, 
even learning any kind of visual template, so chemical equations, mathematical equations, you can learn them visually. Somebody that has this difficulty will struggle with that. Um, somebody that's really good here, I have this strength, is, is a visual photographic memory. I could just memorize my textbooks and I could memorize my notebooks. So really, really critical for um, reading. And what do we do, what's the exercise for this area, just to give you a little window into what we do. And this student is studying um, a language from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is Amharic. And a lot of people ask, well, if he's struggling with English, why are we giving him Amharic? And the reason we use foreign symbol patterns is we don't want compensation. So we don't want them to put sound to it. We don't want them to put meaning to it. If it was English, they could do those things. So they'd be using other regions of the brain to try to solve this problem. We want to work that visual memory for symbol patterns. And the students go through multiple languages from simple to complex. And by the end, they're being able to hold eight Chinese characters in their mind's eye. And after that, English actually looks pretty easy. But the, again, the idea of all these exercises, we're not trying to teach a skill. Um, we're not teaching content. We're trying to work the brain to change its capacity to learn what it was designed to do in that function. And what we see as students improve in this, this cognitive exercise, spelling improves, word recognition, reading speed, uh, any kind of visual matching, remembering symbol patterns, all shifts because we're changing that capacity. There's a number of research studies that have been done on the work. They're all summarized on the website if people are interested. Um, We've done studies with different researchers, different research designs, different schools implementing the Aerosmith program, and we've seen a lot of positive outcomes from that research. So we see significant changes on academic measures. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but this is all on our website. So this was a study done at the University of Calgary, the Brain Game Lab with um, Brad Hale and uh, some of the researchers that worked with him. <coughs> and we saw changes using the Woodcock-Johnson um, significant changes in reading subtests, mathematics, writing, and receptive language as students were moving through the program. And again, we're not teaching these students academics. Like, there's no academic instruction in these cognitive exercises. It was the cognitive programs that allowed these individuals to learn more effectively in all these areas. And then what we've also seen is rate of learning shift. These were students in the Toronto Catholic District School Board in Toronto. Um, and what we looked at, these students... Prior to the program, they were learning about a third to a half of a year per year, which we know happens with students with learning difficulties. They get further and further behind in, in their academic learning and skill acquisition because of their difficulties. So we had that information on word recognition, reading speed, passage, passage comprehension, and arithmetic. And they were in the Aerosmith program for a year, this group. And they were getting less academics. Like prior, they had more academic intervention. They'd had, um, you know, sp special intervention reading programs. Now, half a day, they're doing Aerosmith cognitive exercises. So less academic intervention. And what we saw was their rate of learning doubled or tripled on academic measures. Not because we were teaching them the content. We were changing the brain's capacity to learn that content. To me, which is so much more powerful. And then again... Uh, this was a study looking at um, cognitive measure changes with um, Brad Hale's team at the University of Calgary on the Woodcock-Johnson. And we saw things auditory processing, fluid reasoning, um, uh, processing speech, short-term memory, phonemic awareness, working memory, all shifting as a result of the cognitive intervention, which was really um, positive. And we, we see this. And then this was a, a more recent study looking, again, the Woodcock-Johnson, um, the Blue is uh, LD students that were in um, traditional special education programs, the redder in Aerosmith, and it was averaging the, all the cognitive measures on the Woodcock-Johnson and all the achievement measures. And you can see that the Aerosmith group over the course of a year uh, significantly improved much more than the students in traditional special education. And again, to me, it's the power, <coughs> excuse me, if we can change the brain and its capacity to learn, it's just going to learn. 
And then we looked, we broke it down and looked at some of the measures. So again, writing, written expression, academic aptitude. Again, the Aerosmith group <coughs> outperformed <coughs> the other group. And again, they're getting less academics and doing better on academics. And this was looking at cognitive fluency and long-term retrieval, um, again on the Woodcock, <coughs> and showing uh, you know, significant gains for the individuals in the, the Aerosmith program. And what's really exciting, we're doing some imaging research now. So we've got measures on academic, cognitive measures, but what's actually happening in the brain with these individuals as they're going through the program? We're doing a study out here at UBC with Dr. Lara Boyd and her team, and also at Southern Illinois University with Dr. Greg Rose um, and, and his team in Carbondale, Illinois. And again, this is preliminary data. I asked the researchers would they um, obviously scan the students prior to intervention and at the three-month mark, and now we have one-year data as well. Because what we see is students in these programs is around the three-month mark that they start to notice change in their cognitive function. It was certain for, certainly for me about the three-month mark. And usually parents and other educators start to see that, that change. It's certainly not finished by a long shot, but we're starting to see change. So were we seeing things in the brain at the three-month mark? And to me it was really uh, rewarding that yes, we were. So this is um, students doing the reasoning exercise in the scanner. We had to adapt it because there's not a lot of movement that you can do in the scanner. And what we saw at the three-month mark is the brain is processing much more efficiently. Um, and that's important because if you're having to bring a lot of resources to do a task, it's not really efficient. You might be using other areas rather than the area that was designed to do that. You're compensating or trying to work around. At that three-month mark, it became much more efficient and less real estate in the brain was taken up to actually have to do that. And then to me what was really promising was the changes that we were seeing in the prefrontal cortex, which is the front part of the brain. It's what people talk about executive functioning, planning, problem solving, thinking, impulse control. And this is the resting state. So you know the individuals are just lying in the scanner resting. And it's kind of a misnomer because your brain never rests. Even when you're resting, your brain is active. And often it's the front part, which is thinking um, while you're in that scanner. And what you can see, these are the students here at prior to intervention, and that's the prefrontal cortex, that tiny little red dot. And what you can see, three months in, much more activation. And we know these students tend to be disorganized um, and have some problems with attention and impulse control. And to me, it was really positive that we're seeing changes. And the one month or the one year um, data shows this uh, even more so. So I remember one student that was working on this exercise, and I think she was about 19, and came into the school one day looking really depressed. And I thought, you should be really excited because you know, your parents are seeing these changes, you're seeing these changes. And she said, you know what, there's a stop sign in my brain now. And she said, I don't know if I like that. She said, before I could be impulsive, I could just do things without thinking about them because she wasn't capable of thinking about them. Um, and now it was like, she said, I'm just stopped. And my brain tells me, like, think about this and is this really a good decision to make? I mean, eventually she got that incorporated and it, it was fine, but it was just really interesting, and that's what this part of the brain is, is you know, thinking about it. it's just that stop sign that makes you stop and think about what you're going to do, kind of consequential thinking, before you actually do it. Um, and then the work that Greg Rose is doing, um, he's seeing um, a lot of changes, and I'm just going to read what he wrote to us just recently. He says, our one-year data shows better executive function, which should translate into better organizing of daily tasks and following through to get them accomplished, as well as more thoughtful decision making and overall planning. The imaging results also suggest that the brain regions involved in an internal processing of information, thoughtfulness, and memory function better. So, you know, two studies being done at two universities showing similar uh, changes in the brain, supporting what we've seen for over 35 years in this work. So, what are some of the other areas that we work on? 
auditory memory. So this is the person, you probably all know people, that you have to write notes on their hands, they have to have post-it notes up around the house. Um, the student that comes home knows they have homework, but really kind of has no idea exactly what it is because they can't hold the information. Or the child, you ask them to go upstairs and do three things, they come down, they're really happy, they've done one, but they really have no recollection that you asked them to do two other things. And sometimes these individuals get labeled um, as irresponsible because they aren't doing what they're being asked to do. And if they have this difficulty, I promise you they are not irresponsible. They just can't hold all of the auditory information. Um, and this is a person that wouldn't like books on tape because they don't really learn from um, an auditory environment. And then there's number sense, or what one researcher calls quantity blindness. This is a person that 10, 100, 1,000, all are exactly the same. They can't budget. They can't time schedule. There's no sense of, of quantity or of number. They run out of gas on the highway. Um, they can't, I had a psychiatrist I worked with who had this problem, and she would double book clients um, because she just had no idea of you know, what that 50-minute hour really looked like. She couldn't balance her checkbook. I worked with an opera singer that had this problem. She couldn't do time signature in music because that's related to this, this function. And then there, we work with people, we have a program for individuals that can't learn motor plans that are critical for writing. So this is the student you talk to or the individual you talk to and they can be brilliant and articulate and they can go on and tell you a whole story. You put a pen in their hand and in 10 minutes, maybe three words or three sentences go down on paper. It's not that they don't have the ideational content. They do. They can't translate it into the motor plan, into the writing process. And it also affects eye tracking in reading. And so this was a student that had this difficulty. Uh, he was given, I think, 10 minutes to write on a topic. And this is what he could write. And you see it's not really very organized on the page also because they can't plan where to put those symbols down on the page. And this was a year later. And in the same 10 minutes, it went on for three pages. And we didn't teach him writing. We just worked on the cognitive function. We didn't teach him cursive writing. Um, cursive writing actually is a more complex motor plan than printing. He just started to do cursive. And he had all these ideas in his head. We didn't put these ideas in. He just couldn't get them down on paper. I had one uh, young adult student talk about feeling trapped inside his head because he had all these ideas, but he couldn't, um, he couldn't demonstrate them in writing. And then there's the nonverbal difficulty. Um, one researcher calls this cognitive Goldilocks, which I think is a really apt um, way to describe it. This is the region in the brain that allows you to project yourself into a situation before you get into that situation and create a plan of how you want to behave and what the outcome you want to get out of that situation. So say you're going to a party um, and you want to really interact with you know, John over there. So you'll walk into that situation, you'll kind of step back, you'll survey, you'll look at the body language, you'll look at the voice tone. And then you'll create a plan of how you're going to get into that situation to interact with that person. And then once you get into that situation, this is the part of the brain that allows you to do that minute-by-minute minute reading of how is your behavior being interpreted and are you getting the outcome that you want so you can um, navigate socially. And if somebody has trouble here, you can see all the things they really struggle with um, social navigation, with interpreting um, behavior. They do what I call premature closure. They'll look at one or two elements in a situation, interpret the situation based on those one or two elements, but they haven't looked at all of the information. So they're running with a not full interpretation and they get into social difficulties as a result of that. Somebody who's really good here is a really skilled negotiator because they can do all that, that, um, that reading. So if we look at this picture, I showed it to a 12-year-old student who had this difficulty and asked her what she thought was happening here. And she looked at it and then looked at me and she said, they're playing badminton. And um, I kept a really straight face and asked her why she thought that. And she pointed, it's really hard to see in this picture, but there's netting on this woman's hat up here. And this was severe premature closure. She just looked at that netting, she interpreted net, badminton net, they're playing badminton. Clearly, there are lots of elements in that picture that show that they're not playing badminton. Um, an 18-year-old student looked at this picture, and she told me that they were at City Hall in Toronto, 
and certainly it wasn't the city hall I knew, um, but she pointed to the rope in the foreground, and she'd been at city hall the week before, and there was an area cordoned off with a rope. So again, that premature closure, you look at one element, you make a whole interpretation. The girl that told me about badminton, she was on a no-fly list in her neighborhood. Nobody wanted to play with her because they said she lies all the time. Well, she wasn't lying. This was her worldview. Like, this is how she saw her world. Um, we address this problem. She's now in her 30s, successful, navigates the social world, um, and isn't going to make those kind of mistakes. But again, what I've learned is there's no part of the brain that isn't you know, important, that isn't going to have some impact on somebody's um, ability to engage and relate to the world. And if we think about, you know, um, we were told earlier about attentional problems, um, there are multiple difficulties that can lead to ADD or ADHD. And I'm just going to talk to a few of them which the program works on. The prefrontal cortex, the left and in the left and right hemisphere, one of the jobs of that part of the brain is to regulate attention to solve um, problems or for um, to reach goals. So this is a part of the brain you've got a problem or you've got something, a goal that you want to accomplish out here and it allows you to keep your eye on that goal. So as you're moving towards that goal, there are going to be lots of distractions and it's going to say, well no, that's not going to really bring you to solve that so just ignore that, like the butterfly flying outside the window isn't as important as you know um, doing this reading right here. So it keeps the brain focused and engaged and regulates attention to solve problems. If there's a problem here, that butterfly outside the window is just as important as what's down here, and the attention wanders. As we address the, the symbolic or artifactual thinking problems, we see that shift, because now the brain can regulate attention towards solving problems. The other um, thing that we see is what I call cognitive load. This is where m the student has multiple difficulties, multiple areas that are underperforming. They're sitting in class, and I often say to parents, imagine if you went into that classroom or you started your day putting on a backpack with 40 pounds of rocks on your back. You'd get really tired very, very easily, and you'd be trying to find lots of ways to get rid of that backpack. And that's kind of similar to these individuals. They're sitting in class being asked to do things that these cognitive areas aren't really able to perform efficiently or effectively. They can do it for a while, but they get exhausted, and then their attention starts to wander. As we work on these cognitive functions, we lighten that cognitive load. The person can sit in class and engage and learn, um, and they, they, the brain doesn't get exhausted and tired, and their attention stays on task. And what we find um, with students as we address these difficulties, a number of students that come into the program are on medication um, to support attention. And over time, as we're addressing these cognitive difficulties, a majority of them can come off of medication, obviously working with a doctor. And I'm just going to really quickly go through just a couple more and then open it up for questions. <laughs> I thought a lot, like I work with a lot of adults, and certainly they work with adults out here um, at uh, Eden Cognitive Improvement Center. And what we, I see in adults at times is what I call a cognitive mismatch. They're involved in a, a job or a career where there's a critical cognitive function that isn't at the level that it needs to be to carry that out. So if we think about that auditory memory, I worked with an individual who was a pilot, and he couldn't hold the information from the air traffic controller that was kind of necessary. Um, so he would get the air traffic controller to repeat the instructions over and over again. But I thought, what if you're flying into um, you know, Chicago O'Hare, which is a really busy airport, and that air traffic controller can only say something once or twice? Um, so I used to joke with him and say, if I was getting on an airplane, I wanted to know where he was flying and make sure I wasn't flying in his airspace. But the better thing was to address the problem, which we did, and now he can hold the information. Um, if we think about that piece, part of the brain that we talked about that holds the look of things, like you know the cat, I worked with an individual that was um, doing his residency in pathology at a teaching hospital in the United States, and he had that difficulty. And he was um, examining a slide with um, um, breast tissue on it. It was somebody that had, had breast cancer. She'd gone through uh, chemotherapy and radiation, and now we see was she in remission. 
and he knew how important this was. So he was really diligent and really careful, and he looked at that slide, and he looked at that slide, and he was just about to write that the person was in remission when his supervisor came and said, didn't you see these cells up here? This is cancer. And he looked at them, but he hadn't recognized them. So he knew that he had to do something. So he exited out of the program, worked on the, the exercise we have for that, and addressed that, that problem. And so he won't make that kind of error. But I think a lot of the things that we think about as accidents sometimes could be this cognitive mismatch where the demand of the task isn't um, compatible with that person's cognitive profile. I worked with somebody who's on the Olympic ski jump team, and you think about coming down those chutes really, really fast. And he had a mild imperception on the left side of the body, not nothing like my difficulty, so really mild. And if he was doing anything else, it wouldn't have been that critical. But going at that speed that quickly, it was critical. So he would fall to the left side of his body um, too frequently, and it, it became a problem. So again, all of these, these areas are really, really important. And what I'd sort of like to just leave you with um, to think about is you know, how we can take this concept of neuroplasticity and harness it to make it a difference in the lives of individuals that are struggling with learning. And you know, my vision for education is that every child starting school in grade one would have the opportunity to do cognitive exercises because I think what do we learn with? We learn with our brain. Um, and if, you know, as we've shown in this research, if we change the capacity of the brain to learn, individuals learn much more efficiently, effectively, and actually learning becomes fun and enjoyable. A lot of the adults that we work with say that they felt their careers were chosen for them. They felt when they got to that point to decide what they were going to do in their life, there were so many doors closed, and there might only be one or two doors open, so they had to walk through one of those doors. And I think what this work does is it opens multiple possibilities. And maybe they'd still choose to walk through that one door, but now it's a choice that they're making rather than feeling like it's, it's a forced choice. And I think you know, if we started to address these, these areas really, really early, and if we started in grade one, I mean, some of the students would not have learning difficulties. Um, some of the students probably wouldn't be identified till grade two or three or four. Um, but all of them could benefit. So those individuals that would be maybe identified by grade two, three, or four would never get identified because they're just addressing the, the cognitive areas early. And there'd be no stigma because everybody's doing the cognitive exercises. And those individuals just with unevenness in the profile, like the pilot or that pathologist, would get that addressed very, very early. And if there's that rare person out there that has everything in place, it still wouldn't hurt to you know, enhance um, function. So that's what I would really like to, to see, and that's in my book. That's how I ended my book in terms of my vision. And I really felt when I wrote that that I would not see that in my lifetime. And there's now a school in South Carolina that has their grade two class working on two of um, my cognitive exercises. And there's a school in uh, Australia <coughs> that is taking their, took their incoming grade one class and put them on that motor plan um, exercise for learning motor plans for writing because that's one of the things you start in grade one. And interestingly, in that group, um, they started in February because that's when school starts in Australia. And <clears throat> there were a group of students identified in kindergarten, I think five students that were going to go into reading recovery because they'd been identified as really at risk. Nine weeks into the program, not one of them needed reading recovery because the cognitive capacity was starting to shift and they were starting to um, pick up the symbol patterns. The eye tracking was improving. They didn't need what um, they probably would have needed if they hadn't had that intervention. Um, so that's my passion and where I would like to see this work go. And to be in schools like Eaton Aerosmith, um, and now the Watson Center for, for Brain Health. Um, you know, I often think, like, what am I going to do when I grow up? Um, and I, I, I'm passionate about this work. I mean, this is what I've dedicated my life to because I know the struggles. Um, I know the toll on mental health if these, these problems aren't addressed. So thank you.
Thank you, Barbara. So we're going to have uh, questions and answers. We actually have about 45 minutes uh, before they want to. I think 45 minutes is that right? Yeah. Um, I want to tell a, a story first of all about this, even if you don't have any of these cognitive weaknesses. Uh, I was desperate for my wife to do the assessment because uh, she probably has some of these things. You know, you know, we have trouble sometimes communicating, and for sure she has some of these cognitive deficits. So my wife's really, really a wonderful person. She said, sure, I'll, I'll go. And she goes to Eaton Aerosmith School and meets with, I think, Sarah Cohen, or one of the assessors, and does the assessment, and then it comes back. And I'm, you know, she goes in privately to meet, and she comes back smiling. And I said, oh, okay, what, what deficits do you have? You know, and she said, oh, I'm good at everything. And I said, no, that can't be possible. I guess I'm the one who has all the problems in perceiving. So, uh, but anyways, I agree. I think even if you have strengths in so many things, you can even further improve your cognitive functioning. I also want to make uh, a note that uh, Norman Deutsch in his book, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself, describes or compared the Aerosmith program's work to people like Helen Keller, for example. So here today in front of you, you have a pretty remarkable individual who's changing the face of education and so much so that uh, tomorrow there's going to be a meeting at UBC. People are flying in from around the world, Europe, Australia, uh, North America, uh, to meet uh, with a member of the Faculty of Medicine, uh, a researcher, uh, and a Faculty of Education researcher who want to come together and do a collaboration in educational neuroscience because of the work that Barbara is doing. Uh, so if you're interested in philanthropy uh, and you're here, please come and talk to me. Uh, we're certainly, it's going to be the first one ever in Canada. So it's a remarkable. I, I know the Aerosmith team in, in Toronto, Debbie Gilmore, Charles Bartlett, uh, Jessica Poulin, uh, have as much admiration as our team has in the lives that you're changing. Uh, I, I, I wake up every morning sometimes exhausted and saying, maybe I'd do another field, but you inspire me all the time to say, okay, get going, you can do it, keep going, keep plugging away, because there is resistance to the paradigm shift of neuroscience and education, and it's not easy to face the criticism that Barbara faces, and she's faced it for 35 years, and I've faced it for 11, <laughs> so it's just remarkable, your perseverance and determination to bring this world to children uh, and to adults, uh, with learning disabilities and now to traumatic brain injury. Uh, so uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here in town and I thank you.